Welcome to another great edition of Beacons of Light. And this is a show I'm really excited about because I got Dave Berenger, the national CEO, with me today to talk about the society, something we both love so very much. And Dave, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks. Uh, I don't know why it took you so long to invite me, Michael. I but know. I'm very happy to be here. Well, because Baton Rouge is a place that a lot of people don't get to travel to. And <laughs> my right. guess is you probably had two connecting flights to get here unless <laughs> you flew to New Orleans, which New you Orleans. got a straight. Yes. Yeah, you had a straight flight. Yeah. So we're hard to get to, but you're going to love the Vincentian family while you're here. I'm I promise sure. you. I'm sure. And that's kind of, you know, what's your journey with the uh, Vincentian family through the whole country? Mine's a little unique in that I was not a Vincentian before I was asked to become the national CEO. I grew up in uh, Washington, D.C. in the Maryland suburbs. And as a child, you know, you, whatever you see is what you're used to. So as a child, my local church was either the Franciscan Monastery of the Holy Land, a fantastic venue, or the National Basilica at Catholic University. So I thought all the churches looked like that. And so I think it was easy for me to take the basics of Catholicism for granted and the Society of St. Vincent de Paul was not really a part of that upbringing. I learned of the Society mostly as a competitor working for another nonprofit with thrift stores. And so I knew that they were one of the good guy competitors and that they were faith-based and that they, they did good things with the money that they raised through the stores and so forth. But I had no idea about the rest of the Vincentian mission and activities. So when I was introduced to it, it was kind of like finding your future spouse and you go, where have you been all my life? <laughs> Because uh, I was looking for a way to put my faith into action. Uh, I had always been a volunteer uh, at the church level, diocesan level, but had not seen the, the particular energy that comes around being a part of the Vincentian family. So uh, I remember my wife telling me, Dave, you have to take this job because it combines your business skills with your faith. And as I looked into it more, as usual, she was right. <laughs> and so uh, here I am. Uh, and it's, it's a wonderful blessing because I get to travel around the country seeing so many different ways that Vincentians serve people in need. And then as part of my job, telling the world about it. Well, I can tell from your energy that that uh, visiting and uh, learning and growing has affected your spiritual life Absolutely. immensely. Absolutely. Uh, it's so fulfilling to see the, the many creative ways that Vincentians, as I said, put their faith into action serve people in need, often with little or, or few resources, right? Uh, but they find a way. And even if they don't have any money, they're still present in the lives of people who are in poverty. And they can pray with them and just be with them. And I think sometimes we take for granted the power of that presence. And it is a power that, uh, and, and what a great picture you painted. I mean, you you painted the uh, churches there in Washington D.C., mm -hmm. the Basilica, and you know I I went to the Basilica when we were in Baltimore for the National Assembly, a great assembly mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. It was just fabulous, and uh, what great leadership they had there in Baltimore. But I come from a different part of the world where I walked into that, and it's like. I've never seen anything like this in my life, you know? Well, it was kind of funny for me because having, again, grown up there, and then here I am 60-some years later, I get the opportunity to actually place a mosaic of the society's founder in the basilica. And so there, there's a mosaic of, as you know, Frederick Ozanam. I saw it. It was beautiful. That's in the Vincentian Chapel. And I kept thinking back to when I was a child, thinking I had no idea I'd actually be putting things on the wall in here. There you, know? you go. <laughs> what? It was a lot of fun. What, what a powerful way, and a powerful way to describe the different parishes throughout the entire United States. And uh, I, I'm always amazed with the Vincentian spirit of ingenuity, creativity, yes. and, I, I, and you've had the blessing to see that, whether it's in the South, North, West, East. What are some of the things that really have touched you and really you know, grabbed your attention? A few years ago, uh, I produced a TV show called Our Faith in Action, the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. And we decided from the beginning not to make it a show about the services we provided, but the perspective of a Vincentian in providing those services. So I got to go around the country as the producer and watch the real professionals do the, the work. Um, but to see so many ways that a, a food pantry, for example, can be designed based on whether it's the, the space, uh, the, the methodology in which they get their food, uh, or just the people that they serve, for example, as you know, uh, we get people from all over the world that might come into an urban area 
they don't even know how to use the fruits and vegetables that we may get from the local food bank. So the food uh, pantry becomes not only a, a distribution center, but almost like a miniature chef kitchen showing people, here's the recipe of how to use this vegetable or how to cook this fish, uh, because they'd never seen it before. And, and we, again, we take it for granted what we get from the grocery store. Uh, but as Vincentians, the rest of the world comes to us sometimes. And so we have to accommodate and, and help to train. Otherwise, the food is right in front of them. But if they don't know how to prepare it and how to have nutrition from it, it's a waste of resources. We have all kinds of different challenges of incensions, whether you're right, food, depending on what it is, it may require that extra step like you just described. Yes, I had a donor that came to me years ago and said, I'm really interested in solving the concept of food deserts. And in this case, what she meant was in urban areas, there, you no longer have a neighborhood grocery store. Or if you have one, it only provides packaged goods. So there's no fresh produce or even fresh meats sometimes. So she wanted to find a way that the society could help. And I always feel like my job is looking for a way to say yes between donors and Vincentians to put all of these resources to work. So we came up with an idea of an urban uh, farm grant and asked uh, our Vincentian conferences, the parish-based groups, to uh, apply for a grant in which they could either provide a garden, actually grow a garden there in that community, or find a way to bring food in to these deserts so that the people in need wouldn't have to travel far out to find these resources. And uh, once again, uh, they were probably accommodated 20 different ways in how to make this work. So we learned a lot. They're not all best practices, but they're certainly models that we can share from, uh, in this case, a grant of thousands of dollars. And we gave, I think it was $5,000 per conference. So it was enough to be creative and to be sustainable. It wasn't a one-time distribution of tomatoes. It was, what, what can we do over the course of a year? And then through that time, the conferences often found other ways that they could make this program go once the grant ran out. So we hopefully still have those resources at play in cities across the United States. Creativity and action, recognizing needs, that's a hallmark of our society, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, Every year there's something that affects us and we have to look at how we can do things differently. Either it's the, the change in the population, change in the money, uh, change in uh, just society. Uh, as we were talking earlier, COVID and pandemics certainly created some huge changes in how we serve people. Um, and local or national conditions just make us have to stay nimble. No doubt. And we are always called to be nimble in our Vincentian ministry. And when we come back, we're going to talk to Dave about, you know, the challenges that confronted us during the pandemic, some of the things that we did at a national level and also local levels, just to make our Vincentian ministry come to life for those who truly needed a helping hand of hope during those difficult times. And he will be able to share from a national perspective all the creativity he saw during a worldwide pandemic when we come back. For over 20 years, the St. Vincent de Paul Community Pharmacy has served our area. We provide prescription medicines for those who have nowhere to turn for this most basic health care need. Please, if you need your medicine or you know a family member that needs their medicine, contact us. Kay, how can they get in touch? 383-7450. Give us a call today and spread the word so that we can ensure no one goes without their prescription medication. Welcome back. I'm blessed to be here with Dave Berenger, our national CEO. Dave, we're having a great discussion about our Vincentian journey, and the pandemic offered one heck of a journey. It sure did. If you think about uh, the workings of the Society of St. Vincent de Paul, if you wanted to create something that was like our worst enemy, the pandemic fit the bill. Uh, we weren't allowed to see each other, and, we're, and the society is based on home visits and, and having that personal encounter. We weren't able to meet as groups and the society conferences meet every two weeks or so to, to pray together and serve together. 
um, the technology changed and everything else. So suddenly we weren't able to do our basic work, so food pantries and home, or, uh, excuse me, home visits and food pantries and other things with that, with that presence. So we had to really pivot as a society. And once again, we saw this happen in different ways across the country um, where we used, used the telephone for home visits. We would have a food pantry where people would drive up and we would give them the food in the trunk of their car all masked and gloved up and so forth, but we were staying six feet away from the, the trunk to the driver's seat, you know, that kind of a thing. And so I don't think we missed a beat. In fact, um, if you look back on it now and say, thank God it's over, we found some new ways that might have even been more efficient or friendlier or whatever good thing you can think of to uh, expand the work of the society. We've never been about being efficient. We've been about being personal. And so Many of our Vincentians welcome the opportunity to come back after COVID with even more uh, energy to say, I really missed this because uh, once again, they see the face of Christ in the people that we serve. It's hard to do that when we're wearing a mask. Yes, indeed. Uh, nationally, uh, we had to think about our national meetings. We have a national assembly and then what we call a mid-year meeting for our leaders. Couldn't do that either. So we had to have all kinds of hotel arrangements to not have to pay money for meetings we weren't going to hold and to uh, put those off. And so we went from live meetings to virtual meetings. What we were so pleased to see was we'd go from 700 live participants to 1,700 virtual participants. So, so many more people were able to access the meetings because they could do it from Zoom. And they could even record it and watch it later if they didn't want to watch TV for eight hours at, at a time. Uh, so again, and we, we took that. Pre-COVID, we had maybe a dozen webinars or films every year from the national office. Now we have over 100 because we've utilized this technology and people are used to, to using it and enjoying it. And what I love the best is someone will see a product that we do and then take it to their conference meeting and share it with everybody else. So that distribution of, of the, the faith journey, the, the uh, business activities and so forth re has really expanded. This could not have happened without both volunteers and professional staff that we have around the country to say, okay, how can we work together? It's always a challenge when you have a, a very volunteer driven organization, but with the need for professional staff to take on different tasks to help the society to grow and to be legal and to uh, uh, be in, in uh, compliance with so many regulations and, and, and requirements of the church and everybody else. So when we went through something as uh, large as a pandemic, in a way it became a rallying point for us to say, okay, we need to work together, put all of the things behind us that maybe kept us from working together. We need to get through this and see the other side. And I think uh, the society around the country, 4,400 conferences, probably several thousand professional staff and up to 90,000 volunteers really pulled together. I'm so proud of the society for what they did and what they accomplished during that period. No doubt about it. Uh, my local society says I look better in a mask. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so when we took the mask off, it was like, ah. but in all seriousness, you said something that I, I want to give you credit for. I want to give uh, our beloved Roger Plainwin, uh, mm -hmm. uh, credit for, uh, because under y'all's leadership as a national CEO, y'all really have done a wonderful job bringing professional Vincentian staff and volunteer staff together as a Vincentian family. And I think that's important. Don't you at a national level to yes, see that? Yes, thank you. And, and I guess I saw it because I was a lifelong volunteer, but I also worked for various nonprofits really since I got out of college. I worked for several of the larger national charities. Uh, and so I was used to different relationships between staff people and volunteers. It works best when you have a, a, a professional person, I'm, I say that wrong, we're all professionals, but a paid person who believes in the mission. And it's critical to a faith-based organization. Uh, as you and I know, we have some executives who don't last that long because they just don't, not that they don't buy into it, but it's not a part of their soul. And it gets very tiring to be uh, on call 24 seven, working with volunteers, working with people in need, the need never ends. And so if you don't have that inner spirit and, and uh, energy to really move forward, it may not be the job for you. But for the right people where they can utilize the business skills that they have, the, the professional public speaking or accounting or whatever other skills they have, and allow and help a, a nonprofit to really expand and do its job even better that's a real winner. And those people tend, like you, 
stick around for quite a well, while. Well, you're very kind. So. Well, well, you're an example of that in action. Roger was an example yep. of that in action. Y'all gave your heart, your mind. And, and you're right, the colleagues around the country that just, you, you know, that really just have their Vincentian ministry right up there, and they're growing every day in every way. You know? Sometimes when I go to a meeting, I forget who's who. Yeah, that's good. Because we all look like volunteers in the room. And that's when right. The, when the executives uh, may pull off and have their own session to talk about staffing things and, right. and things that volunteers don't really work with. Right. It's like, oh, that's right. You got, you're the paid guys. Yes. Uh, yeah. But we're all Vincentians together. That's right. There, there's no uh, separateness no. that we may have once had. Uh, we're in the bar together, we're in a restaurant together, having fun, sharing stories. And especially, uh, I always say when you go to a national meeting, you know, we have the workshops, but you learn more in the hallway. Oh yeah. Talking to people about what you've learned and, and what's great about Vincentians versus other charities I've worked with. We don't just talk about the things that worked. We're happy to talk about the things that don't work so that we can learn from each other. Right. And some of those stories are more valuable right. because uh, we want it to work so much and we just have to find the right way. And, and maybe our friend from another part of the country has that answer for us. I hate to ever do anything for the first time, you know, because mm -hmm. you don't have a model to look at. And, and so that's where you learn the hard lessons. But when you have this Vincentian friendship throughout the country, whether it's volunteers or staff, you can call somebody. And, and even listen. around the world, because yeah. I, I talk to other country leaders uh, and uh, based on their economic and political and everything else uh, conditions, they're even more creative than we are sometimes. Uh, we do a lot of work in Haiti yes. and it's truly the poor serving the poor there. And they have you know, all kinds of political corruptions and economic strains and everything else. They're still Vincentians. So we can learn a lot from that. Uh, in my first job, I worked for the Red Cross. Had hardly any money in a budget. If you learn how to do a job with no money, once you have money later, it's all fun. You, you can just do so much more. But, but it's, a, it's a good way to start, especially at the beginning of a career, to learn how to do without and still meet the mission. Yeah. Because then you can only grow from there. Yes, and uh, you've grown our society at a na national level at a remarkable pace. And the vision for the future, we're going to come back and we're going to talk with Dave a little bit about um, the future of the society, the importance of membership in the society, and where our, our Vincentian family really needs to grow to better meet the needs of the poor and those neighbors in need that depend on us and depend on our ministry when we come back. The Society of St. Vincent de Paul's first cookbook, Taste and See, is the gift which helps share the goodness of the Lord with those most in need. Featuring recipes from Chef John Foles, each chapter begins with a short story about one of our special work programs. To order your copy of Taste and See, please call the Society or visit our website. Help multiply blessings for the neediest in our community. Welcome back. I'm here with Dave Berenger, and we're talking about the society we know and love. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last uh, 11 plus years have been a gift to you. What's your vision for the society going forward? Well, it's, it's interesting, Michael. We're about to undertake a process we're calling Vision SVDP. And we'll be asking every Vincentian around the country for their vision. So I would like to think mine doesn't count any more or any less than anyone else's. Uh, but from my perspective and what I get to see every day from around the country, uh, we need to focus on membership growth, not only because uh, we want to have more people to serve, but it's our very mission to help people grow in holiness. So we should be looking for as many new people to grow in holiness as possible. Mm -hmm. And of course, poverty is always there with us. There's more things to do, whether it's the way we've done them before or new ways. Uh, my second thing would be to take a look at technologies to see if there are ways that we can learn better, share better, and serve better. And I guess the, the third way is to just have a, a heart and a, and a set of ears and eyes to listen to what God's telling us 
and what people in poverty are telling us. It's easy to come in as the rich white guy and say, this is what you need. But what I, what I for example, need to do is to say, okay, for your person that's an immigrant, another country, no money, maybe no friends, no family, what do you really need? The thing that drives me crazy sometimes is when I serve at my local food pantry and I see the same family coming back week after week after week. Um, it's very frustrating because I think, well, if we realign our resources and especially our time and spend more time with this family and what we call systemic change, let's find ways we can get them out of this line because they no longer need to come here. So that would be my long-term goal is to not focus on how many people come to us. If anything, it should be fewer people because we've helped them to get out of poverty permanently. I don't know how to do that. I can only imagine it takes more time and more money and everything else, but it's worth the journey to, to try. So that would be my vision is to, is to get more people permanently out of poverty and uh, let them explore all the fruits that God has for them. That is a great vision. I think all Vincentians share that vision. Sometimes when you get in the rush of uh, either providing food or doing homeless prevention by paying rent or responding to mm -hmm. homelessness by providing shelter or whatever, right. you're kind of caught in an emergency sh situation and it can be overwhelming. But I agree with you. Our, our success is that hot meal. That's a victory because right. uh, we we're solving hunger. Uh, but the bigger victory is helping that person find that job and helping them to maybe think differently uh, than they currently do relative to education, um, doing things, vocational training, and making sure they're even aware that these things exist that can help propel them to a bright future. One of the things that I think will help us is we've learned a lot about who we serve in the last 10 years. Uh, the two biggest audiences is a mom with two kids and elderly living alone. So we sort of knew that along the way, but why is that mom and two kids there? We found out that in about 30% of our cases, it's because someone in the family is incarcerated or it's because dad's no longer around. And so the, the broken family, as we used to call it, is a huge root cause of why we have poverty that we do. So God bless moms oh, God <laughs> who are there with, with, with kids and trying to, to keep them stable and grow and everything else. Um, but the more we know about why they're here with us might help us to unlock some of those keys as to how we can help them more permanently. Well, I heard of Incension one time say that, uh, that volunteers at our shelter program, that this mom, she's, she's lost everything but the title mom. Yeah. And, and so building that foundation up to help that single parent do what she needs to do. What a powerful Vincentian mission uh, to look at all the data to see where those opportunities are to help our neighbors in need. And I think we can do that without treating people like numbers. Right. We, we learn from them about their conditions, but we're not putting them into categories. It's exactly. still very much an individual service for, for a real person. Yes. After 35 years, I've seen lots of cases. There's similarities sometimes. Mm -hmm. There are certain things, but everyone's different. Right. And that's how our good Lord and Savior made us. And, uh, and you know, uh, just talking about the gift of the society and the pandemic we talked about earlier, you know, I, I can tell you, I seem to have to learn more, more quickly today <laughs> than just a decade ago. Um, yeah. What it, would your advice be to the Vincentian family as they see these things that are changing so fast? Believe it or not, my advice would be to slow down because we rush through the tyranny of the moment, as we call it in poverty circles, and try to take care of the, the fire that's burning the brightest. And sometimes that makes us miss the bigger story and the bigger solution. That's why I'm so focused on membership marketing, if you will, to get more Vincentians to help us. I always tell leaders in a, what we call our invitation for renewal program of uh, senior leadership programs, your job is not to do stuff, it's to get stuff done. And so our leaders need to recruit more people to help them and spread the wealth. Uh, we have that happen while at the same time we invite a lot of people in at the parish to, to come and join us and then we don't give them a job when they show up. And that's, that's a real problem for us is we don't follow through on the invitation with meaningful uh, contributions including listening to what they have to say as new volunteers and, and their perspectives. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to uh, 
continue to grow, uh, but not to be racist. So I, I understand, sometimes I feel like I'm typing with my feet while I'm watching a video and list, listening to something else. I need to slow down too. Uh, I'll be retiring this year, so that's one way of slowing down. But what I'm hearing from the, the many Vincentians who've written to me, and they're, they're just so kind, is they say, well, congratulations, Dave, on retirement. I tell them, well, I'm not really leaving. I'm going to be as a volunteer. And then they say, oh, great, you'll get to work even harder. <laughs> so uh, I'm looking forward to that, though. So uh, uh, and uh, now I can sit on the other side of the table and complain to the staff or what? No, I'm just kidding. But but there's uh, I'm really looking forward to that opportunity to continue to serve as a Vincentian volunteer, not just a Vincentian staff person. Because your heart was in it from day one, right? And right. it and that's going to grow. Continue. And yeah, every day is a potential. Yeah. Uh, with about a couple minutes to go, what would your message be to anyone out there? considering joining our Vincentian family, what would you say for them to take that next step? I'd share with the audience what I've heard from so many Vincentians, and I hear two things consistently. One is I always get more out of this than I put into it, meaning their Vincentian service. And the second is whenever I serve, I see the face of Christ, and I know that people see the face of Christ in me. They're not saying they are Christ, but they're representing Christ to each other. Um, that's a powerful set of, of things to hear, and I hear it all the time. It's not just one person with a great sound bite. It, it's a lot of people who truly believe this. So come and join us and get that experience for yourself. As I like to say in a marketing campaign sense, see the face of Christ, be the face of Christ. Uh, what a powerful way for each of us to consider how we can serve God and serve each other through the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. Well, Dave, I want to thank you. That's powerful. I want to thank you all these years for being the face of Christ. I, I want to thank you for when I needed to talk to you, you were always available. I didn't call you as often as probably as I sure have. <laughs> so I, I probably learned some lessons I didn't have to learn, but we all grow from that. You've been a God's gift to the society and our Vincentian family. Thank you for all your years and your commitment to our society. Well, well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure meeting you and being a friend. Uh, and a resource for me as well. Thank well, you so much. I look forward to working with you in your volunteer status. Unfortunately, I have many years to go before I can volunteer. <laughs> uh, but if you want to be a part of our Vincentian ministry, go to our national website, svdpusa.org, or our local Vin uh, Vincentian website, svdpbr.org, and see how you can get involved with the great min ministry of our Society of St. Vincent de Paul. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'll see you again next week on Beacons of Life.